Cool. Our first speaker, so the first couple of guests um, are going to be from the Chesapeake Bay region to talk to us about some science that was done up there and some policy things to try to put in place um, payments for ecosystem services for shellfish aquaculture. And so our first speaker is Jeff Cornwell from the University of Maryland. Okay, shall I start? Yes, sir. We can hear you great. All right, and you can see the, the presentation fine? That is also correct. Okay. So uh, just, just for, for context, um, many years ago as a graduate student, I was always suspicious of, uh, of measurements of um, denitrification and systems. The Arctic Lake I worked on had some work done on it. And uh, by the time we had finished the mass balance, we realized all the microbial measurements were about an order of magnitude high using uh, some old techniques. Uh, back in the 90s, working with Todd Khanna, I got involved in, in the development of a different approach for denitrification, which was using gas ratios on a mass spectrometer, which are highly precise, and using N2 to argon, uh, N2 being our, our gas of interest and argon being inert, and using changes in that ratio to make an estimate of the N2 production from denitrification. And so that's what kind of got me going in this. When it comes to oysters, a number of years ago, um, one of my colleagues made a, a, at least a guesstimate saying that, you know, historic numbers of oysters in the Chesapeake Bay could filter uh, the entire bay in less than a week. And I think there was a lot of controversy about that, partly because of the uh, irregular distribution of oysters, but also, you know, I, I think probably an optimistic view of how much an individual oyster can filter. But uh, followed on that with this fellow Roger Newell and, and started working on um, denitrification in, in these kinds of uh, communities. So in the Chesapeake, oysters have been decimated due to harvest and disease. Um, there's a lot of blame that gets passed around. Um, there's a contentious relationship between resource managers and oyster harvesters. We have, uh, and within Maryland, five large no harvest sanctuaries that have been established. And, um, and there's um, a lot of feeling of bitterness from folks who used to harvest from those areas, even though they weren't really viable in terms of uh, um, ongoing harvest just because of the low populations. Uh, aquaculture, Matt, and this is Matt's thing, but uh, it's a rapidly increasing proportion of, of the oyster harvest. Uh, in terms of denitrification, we don't have any data to help with that in the best management practice mode. And so in the last few decades, uh, the role of oysters in, nit in reducing nitrogen through a simulation and denitrification improved a lot. Essentially, there was not a lot of data 20 years ago. Uh, but with the studies in New England and in the Mid-Atlantic have uh, brought this a little bit more to the fore. Um, this is just up here to quickly say, what I'm talking about is, is a whole community of uh, people thinking about how to turn these kinds of scientific results of assimilation and um, denitrification into, into uh, a, a policy. And so, you know, we had a really, a, to my mind, an all-star group of folks associated with the panel. Um, Matt Parker, who's speaking next, is, is on it. And uh, um, lots of people from the Bay Program, different kinds of support within um, for, for the, the panel. Uh, lots of people contributed data. And, um, and we have had lots of stakeholder review when we have things. One thing that can't be emphasized enough is that um, this was one of the key parts of this happened early on, and it's probably about 2015, where all BMPs prior to this one were really for taking uh, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus out of the watershed. Um, you know, removing in wetlands, agriculture, stream restoration, lots of practices. But EPA Region 3 approved the implementation of an in-water BMP associated with oyster nitrogen and phosphorus removal. So that was really, uh, without that determination, um, there was really no way that any of this work could have really been used in, in, in a meaningful way. So what do oysters do? 
um, looking at the panel on uh, the, the, the diagram on the left that uh, uh, from, from Lisa Kellogg's uh, 2013 paper, you're looking at within an ecosystem, you have nitrogen sources, atmospheric runoff. Um, we have um, the production of algae, phytoplankton that are filtered by oysters, producing biodeposits, uh, growing oysters, and in, in increasing the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus both in the tissue and in the shell. And, and then the biodeposits um, can, through the process of coupled nitrification, denitrification, result in the production of N2 gas. Um, rates for that, like I say, have been developed really over the last mostly 10 to 15 years, but, but, um, but uh, there's, there's certainly a lot of data out there now. So the, the effective uh, reduction effective this protocols that we considered at least at the outset we didn't include all these assimilation of oyster tissue and shell of nitrogen enhanced denitrification associated with oysters and the key is enhanced denitrification occurs when you don't have reefs and so you have to take into consideration what what uh, uh, a control or background level would be phosphorus assimilation both in tissue and shell we thought about and and uh, some of our, our committee members, uh, panel members, have would would love to see a, a, a revisit on suspended sediment reduction with oysters, and uh, enhanced nitrogen and phosphorus barely so associated with oysters. Those things are a little bit more complicated because if you pull sediments down, um, it, you have to consider they might have just gone to the bottom somewhere else and not been focused in, in with an oyster reef or, or with aquaculture. Same thing with uh, nitrogen phosphorus burial. Um, you're not, you, you, you have to enhance those rates and there's really no data for these last three things. So what's the element of a BMP and, and both approved and in the works? Well, What's approved, and, and Matt's going to go into this a lot more detail, is an aquaculture tissue of nitrogen and phosphorus. So the harvest and removal of, of, um, um, of uh, oysters from estuarine waters, basically we'll, uh, we, we will um, credit nitrogen and phosphorus in tissue. Shell is a removal of nitrogen and phosphorus, but it is such a valuable commodity everywhere that we understand that an awful lot of it's going to go back of the shell in, into uh, uh, growing new oysters. Um, what we're considering right now are three different components of this. Lic what we're calling licensed oyster harvest tissue, nitrogen and phosphorus, and public reefs. It's analogous to the aquaculture. Um, we have in Maryland, uh, where I'm most familiar, Basically, uh, counties will have a two or three dollar per bushel surcharge. Maybe it's a little bit more than that now, and that goes to replenishing reefs with uh, shell and oyster and spat on shell. And um, the public reefs, you know, the the, the 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 there's some difficulties in in crediting that in the sense that um, anybody from any direction can harvest. So you might have a, a, a local reef next to where I am here that also brings in a group from 50 miles away that they want to harvest it. And so um, what we've looked at, the data very hard, and we're going to credit 3% of, of um, the, the, the uh, oysters deployed as having been um, harvested. Nitrogen and phosphorus assimilation um, in um, oyster reef restoration, this is a one-time credit. So if you go from a flat um, a bottom with, with not much on it, and now you have a sustained biomass of oysters, the total amount of nitrogen and phosphorus within that community, particularly if, uh, if it's uh, um, sustained over time, is a net removal from, from the ecosystem. And then finally, my favorite, the nitrogen removed by enhanced denitrification associated with oysters on restored oyster reefs. And we'll, we'll get to that one a bit more. So the enhanced denitrification protocol goal was to provide defensible, verif ver verifiable estimates of nitrogen reduction from, um, in, from um, in, in oyster reefs. Um, the current 
version of our BMP, our original idea was that there would probably be a requirement for some aspect of um, ongoing measurement to confirm the rates in a given place. And in looking at uh, the hundreds of measurements that Lisa Kellogg and I have done, we realize there's at least a, um, there's a reasonable uh, 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 view that um, we have enough data to, to create a minimum rate that um, would be associated with oyster reefs. And so that's, that's uh, part. what I show here is, is the device and the way we would do it. We dealt a lot of the data, base tray is embedded in, in, in a restoration area. Um, it's covered, brought back to the laboratory where we incubate these things and do time courses uh, to, of dinitrogen, among other things. One of the big questions is what happens to reefs over time? So do we want to keep crediting denitrification because we, uh, at a given level of biomass, what if the biomass goes down? What if it goes up? And so we generally see relationships between denitrification rates and, and oyster tissue biomass. Um, maintenance is really a key to maintaining the B BMP. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time other than the fact that, well, how do you get to tissue? Well, shell height, can help you with, with that number. So biomass, if you look at the biomass class, set it um, low, uh, medium, and high, we can do, that's defined in other places, but the dinitrogen flux on pounds per acre per day goes up as, as um, biomass tends to go up. And, um, as, and we see lots of other biogeochemical changes associated with biomass here in the right hand panel. I won't, uh, I'll spare you the details. A part of um, what my lab has done, but I think the field is, is going to, is lots of tool development. So I showed this before where we basically do what you would call an ex situ incubation. We're working on in situ incubations using uh, chambers. These work really well if you've got a relatively flat reef. Um, we use tracers because the bottom will never seal perfectly and um, do time course measurements um, uh, with, with uh, for oxygen and, and ratio of some of the other species to oxygen. And this works well. I spent a lot of time talking a day or two ago with Bose and other folks about the application of this in some um, mounds in, in Hong Kong. And it looks like, you know, this, is, this, this, is, this approach is gonna be very specific to a relatively flat reef, um, but there may some, be some modifications. We've also looked at things like reef balls. Uh, here's one that, that's uh, one of the highest biomass ones we've seen anywhere out in the mouth of uh, our Chop Tank River. Rates of denitrification are exceedingly high on an aerial basis here. Uh, of course, you don't put out millions of these things that you would need to really get the equivalent of where you are on, on a restoration tree. In the same way, um, in shoreline areas, uh, some of these oyster castles, um, we've gotten some of the highest aerial rates we've ever seen of denitrification anywhere in any ecosystem. What's interesting is in some of the block, some of these blocks without oysters, the bryozoans and, and the barnacles are, are denitrifying also at an alarmingly high rate. So sometimes just putting out structure seems to be that. We're doing some work up in Baltimore Harbor uh, on, on uh, following organisms, and it appears like they denitrify at a really high rate. Uh, there, the problem is water turns over now, uh, every now and then, and, and it's low oxygen, and you can harm the, the whole thing. So what's coming up? Hopefully, at, by the end of this month, we'll have this BMP document available for release to everybody. Um, it'll be subject to public review and examined by Chesapeake Bay program panels, the water quality goal Im implementation team, and the fisheries goal implementation teams. And they will um, give a thumbs up or thumbs down on, on the three different elements of it. That's, that's not where it ends. So now you have an approved BMP, what do you do with it? And that's where the states of Maryland and Virginia have to take this up and basically make policy on how to implement it. Um, part of what this goes to is how to credit the removal that now can be credited as a BMP in the watershed implementation plans that are that we have for many segments of the of, of um, 
our watershed, and then to translate the results so that it can go into the Chesapeake Bay water quality model so that uh, they're reflected in, in that, that uh, part of it. Um, this is the theme of, of, of this workshop is aquaculture, and um, there's some issues. Um, we have tied a lot of our work towards uh, with, with the biomass that are found on the bottom. So in aquaculture, you know, you have to get biomass determinations. Sometimes in some practices, oysters get moved around. That can be problematic in terms of counting. How about harvest effects? What, what is there uh, an episodic release of nitrogen as ammonium or other things uh, due to the harvest? And um, we, despite all this, it seems highly likely we're gonna have a lot of denitrification enhancement associated with, with aquaculture. Uh, we're moving towards getting uh, some measurements done on that regionally. Water column aquaculture, there's lots of issues. Often there's terrible uh, sediment quality in the footprint, sulfitic conditions, um, no denitrification, lots of uh, iron sulfide formation, uh, but not always. Um, if you have a site with lots of uh, strong currents, basically you, you move those biodeposits away and, and uh, um, denitrify them somewhere else. Uh, in one of our local uh, farms here, uh, we estimated that 90% of the biodeposits were moved elsewhere. In order to credit the enhanced denitrification by bringing that to the bottom though, really is probably more of a modeling exercise and that, that that would result in um, uh, a different kind of uh, BMP. Albeit, modeling has been a big part of some of the other best management practices, including stream restoration. Engineered structures, we have enticing, interesting data, but probably not sufficient for any kind of default rates of, of any of this. Uh, what about the relationship to biomass? We see it on some of the reef balls. And for now, it's gonna require site-specific information. Um, you have to add up the cost of the assessment and contrast that to the potential value that you would get for, for nitrogen removal. But, but with these oyster castles, you know, just a really broad uh, observation would be after two or three years, you've at least paid for the, uh, the cost of, of, of the, uh, the cement blocks, if not the, the installation. Um, other than that, that, that's the end of my talk. Um, email me for a link to the BMP document later this month. Comments um, from anybody, anywhere is, are welcome. This, this is not a Chesapeake centric thing. Um, we're always looking to take what we've got, either increase, uh, improve our explanation of what we put down, or if uh, others see ways to it, we'll improve uh, either in implementation or our interpretation, we're more than glad to, to listen to anybody. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Oh. One quick question for Jeff, if anybody. Yeah, yeah I have a question. I didn't fully understand what he meant I'll by repeat the this. terrible sediment quality. And is that um, in one of his, it's close to the end of his talk, but and what that means for like in the water aquaculture and its potential for like denitrification. Yeah. So you, could you explain that a little bit more, what you meant by that? Well, there's yeah, been some, Jeff, obviously. Do, do you need to replace the question? No, the, no, no, I, I'm surprised you can hear it. Go ahead. Yeah, well, so let me repeat it, make sure I've got it correct. And so the, the question is, what do we mean by sediment quality in, in, uh, um, in these floats? And, um, I thought about it a bit, and there's some data, um, Higgins et al. and other folks um, in a very, um, uh, an area with very poor circulation showed that you took poor sediment quality that existed in a little embayment. It made it much worse, because what happens is you overload the sediments with so much organic matter, you run out of oxygen in the top half millimeter or less, you start producing hydrogen sulfide, it's jet black, it's a mess, and, and you don't denitrify because you, you need oxygen to nitrify prior to that. 
And so what happens is you end up with, with uh, probably a, a, a strong negative consequence of that kind of aquaculture. If, however, you locate um, those floats in a place where the physics is a lot stronger and you get dispersal, dispersal of the, um, the biodeposits, that, that pretty much goes away. You have to keep in mind where we are is pretty much microtidal. And so there's going to be places where we have pretty good dispersion and it's going to be lots of places where we have a lot less. We have a, a, an aquaculture farm in front of the lab where I am at Porn Point. And uh, we've got some piers that, that slow down the water a lot. And you can find uh, um, black sediments and production of a lot of, um, uh, of uh, macroalgae as a consequence. The other thing that happens and, and it's, um, is you can take any kind of benthic community, thinking about polychaete worms and, and other animals that are really a big part of nutrient cycling. And you can overload the sediments with biodeposits and pretty much wipe them all out. And so there's there's multiple things going on here, but I think that's that's you have to be a little bit more careful with um, the um, the floats. For whatever reason, you can have the, a lot a big proportion of the same biomass on the bottom, but it seems like there's a benthic community that processes that organic matter much better. Um, so when we were doing some of our work. Uh, in in in, in um, some restoration sites, you know, you, you might have you know uh, fifty to to hundred oysters per square meter. That's a lot, but then you'd have an extra um, um, up to, to seven or eight thousand other small things that are living there. So it's a whole community, and they all conspire to help um, denitrify. And in fact, our best correlations sometimes are to polychaete worms more than oysters. Cool. Thank you very much, Jeff. You're welcome. Uh, Matt, if you want to queue up your, I think, Jeff, you'd have to stop sharing yep. your screen. I got it right now. And so our next speaker is going to be Matt Parker, um, also with the University of Maryland. So, Matt, if you take it away, I think your face should pop up. Okay. Uh... Can you see my presentation and can you hear me? Yep, all good. All right. So uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, my name is Matt Parker. I'm an aquaculture business specialist here at the University of Maryland Extension. And generally I help people do business plans and economics for oyster farms, but I was asked to participate on the nutrient or the best management practice panel um, to bring in the aquaculture perspective. So Jeff talked a lot about the denitrification <clears throat> And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it took to get our first report out the door and what's currently going on with nutrient trading uh, with regards to oysters in Maryland. So here we go. First is a, a second. All right. So the process to establish a best management practice is a uh, time consuming and, and a bit uh, long and <laughs> to say the least so we had first off we had a group which recovery partnership petitioned the epa for permission to look at the the form of panel to look at the topic and then they had to submit everybody's potential 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 panel members to the epa for them to approve and then we had lots of panel meetings lots of information and we're trying to reach a group consensus so all those people that were that Jeff listed in the panel agreed to everything that was in this in in the report that came out. There was if one person said I don't like it, then uh, then we couldn't put it in. And then someone writes up the report, and we have to present it publicly. And then the public submits comments. We have to address public comments. Then we resubmit the report to see if the agency members approve it. And if they approve it, we uh, have a, a BMP. If they don't approve it, we have to go back and figure out what we can do to get them to approve it or, or make a decision from there. And the BMP only covers the specific items in the report. There might be lots of other items that sound cool, but if it's not in the report, then it doesn't go into the BMP. And finally, 
it's up to the municipalities to determine if there's going to be any type of potential uh, compensation for any nutrients that are removed. So the panel just does the, um, the recommendations. So for our oyster BMP panel here in the Chesapeake Bay, like I said, the Oyster Recovery Partnership recommended the formation of this panel in April of 2015. We had our first panel meeting in September 2015. And then what we were charged to do is identify and define oyster practices that we could consider for a best management practice. And then we had to develop a pollutant removal crediting decision framework for those oysters. So it's like, how are we going to decide how what the number is going to be? And then we had to come up with a number to propose the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that's removed from each of the different practices and have to have enough science to support it. So our projected panel end date was August 2016. So this was supposed to be like a year, year and a half kind of project. So everybody was gung-ho and, and ready to do it. But things took much, much longer than we anticipated or kind of expected. There was just so much, so much to do. So our panel, as Jeff mentioned, had 16 members and we had to reach consensus. And on some of these um, topics, it took a long time and lots of discussion on how to reach for us to reach consensus. I mean, we had hour long conversations on the definition of a term in the report to try to get it right. So everyone thought we were um, talking about exactly what we needed to talk about. And then there was a literature review done for all available science to support any number that we could come up with. We examined all the papers to extract information out of them. We looked, just make sure it was appropriate, make sure it was uh, talking about oysters and not about mussels, you know, things like that. If there was an actual number or if there was a range, we looked at white papers. We looked at unpublished data that we could get our hands on. And then we sat down and we talked about nearly every paper and the data that was in it. And then we did some independent analysis of all the data that was put together. So this is quite a laborious task and it takes a while to get all this done. So why did it take so long? Oops. This is a uh, list of everything we wanted to talk about and try to figure out. So we talked about private oyster, oyster aquaculture on uh, the bottom and in water column, the public fishery, and then oyster reef restoration areas, whether they had hatchery diploid or triploid oysters or wild oysters on them, how they got there, whether or not it was a wild set, whether you just put substrate down, whether you just put spat on shell down, if it was a combination. And we came up with these one, two, three, four, five, eight, or eight, 10 or 12 different uh, oyster practices that we had to uh, identify and then figure out whether or not we could come up with a number. So <clears throat> out of all these, you know, the, the 12 or so um, types of practices, you know, then we looked, all right, is there nitrogen in the tissue we can quantify? Is there nitrogen in the shell? Is there enhanced denitrification? Is there phosphorus in the tissue, the shell? Is there a su suspended sediment reduction for with oysters? Is there enhanced nitrogen burial? Is there enhanced phosphorus burial? So we had all these different things to try to look at. So in this table, the orange ones that say first, that was what we thought we could get done in the first report in that year. And we're like, we're going to have to have more than one report. Everything in the gray that says second are things that we thought that we could do in a second report, which is what Jeff was mentioned, hopefully coming out within the next month. And then everything in yellow was like, this sounds really cool, but we don't have any of the data we would need or don't have enough data that we would need to to feel comfortable recommending a number to the EPA. Like maybe there was one paper. We can't do a BMP on one paper. You know, you gotta have lot, lots of data. So the, the first report, we took the low hanging fruit of tissue from aquaculture because aquaculture harvests are reported. They're counted. The farmers know how much they're pulling out, which made it really easy. So we looked at all the aquaculture studies uh, for oysters, to see nitrogen and phosphorus content and anything we find from the Chesapeake Bay and other areas. We looked at 
triploid oysters and diploid oysters to see what the differences were. And then we plotted values of oyster sizes to figure out, all right, well, if a shell height is 100 millimeters, then how much dry tissue is in it? So we can figure out how much nitrogen is in that. And then we did quantile regression because we didn't want to minimize over crediting. We didn't want to take the high number, but we didn't want to take the low number. So this was a way that we could look at it um, to, to take a little bit more of a conservative approach to figure out how much nitrogen and phosphorus are in the oysters that are removed from aquaculture. So our panel made some uh, recommendations. Our, like I said, our first report was submitted in 2016 or September 2016 and was approved by the EPA in December 2016. And we included recommendations for nitrogen and phosphorus removal via oyster aquaculture tissue only. We still had 86 other scenarios to get through and hopefully that didn't take 86 more years. <laughs> so at the bottom is there our, our, our recommendations of how much nitrogen and phosphorus is in an oyster tissue of varying sizes. But if you look at the, let's say the, the three inch class, there is 0 0.09 grams of nitrogen in an oyster, which that's some hard math for the general person to try to figure out how much nitrogen they have. So we came up with a, another table that was based on um, if you harvested a million oysters, how many pounds of nitrogen would there be in that million oysters that you harvest? Um, and it varies based on size because as oysters get bigger, you know, then there's more nitrogen in them because there's more tissue. And it was there was a difference between diploid oysters and triploid oysters. So there's a, a depending on what you're growing, you have a different a different number that you can uh, use to determine how much nitrogen and phosphorus is removed. So six. Since December 2016, what have we been doing for the last uh, almost six years? Well, we've been looking at everything else. You know, we, we had a little break with COVID like everybody, but we got back into it and the last year has been really productive. Uh, we looked at nitrogen and phosphorus and shell, denitrification, glanced back to see if there was anything new with sedimentation. We're looking at things in the, in the public fishery, you know, we're looking at restoration activities. And uh, as Jeff mentioned, hopefully within the next month, uh, we'll have our second report all tidied up and sent out for public review. Now, what I think a lot of people are interested in is what about compensation for these credits? You know, these guys are, are removing nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water that's not currently in the, in the model. So it's helping, helping things out. But keep in mind, the expert panel only comes up with a number for the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that are in the oyster or with the associated practice. Then it's up to the individual municipality, you know, the state, county, or however is managing your, uh, your TMDL or your water quality stuff to determine if and how compensation will be implemented. So uh, Maryland could have said, thank you for your service and just said, we're going to go ahead and credit our TMDL with it for all that wonderful stuff you guys are doing with oyster aquaculture tissue and uh, be done with it. But that's not what they did. They incorporated it into their water quality training program, which is run by the Maryland Department of Environment. So, you know, we passed this thing in 2016, was it? In 2020, almost four years later, we finally had some trades. So we had a trade in the voluntary market from the Baltimore Convention Center, which the voluntary market is like when the airline asks you if you want to pay extra money to offset your carbon footprint for flying to wherever you're going. So I don't know how they, they talked them into it, but uh, they were able to convince the Baltimore Convention Center to purchase four nitrogen credits for $1,600. So that's, that's pretty good, $400 a credit. That's, that's pretty good. And then we had another one through the regulatory market was this is you need to do something about your nutrients and uh, or you get get in trouble kind of thing. So Anne Arundel, Anne Arundel County, which is where uh, Annapolis is, if um, you're not familiar with Maryland, 
they purchased 107 pounds of nitrogen and 12 pounds of phosphorus for $4,950. I don't know what the breakdown was for the pounds of nitrogen versus the pounds of phosphorus price, um, but they did this to offset runoff from, I, I believe it was like a parking lot or somewhere in the watershed where the oysters were grown at. That's it. That's all the trades we've got. <laughs> So this could have been a really short presentation of one slide for an update, but I thought you might want to know some of the other stuff as well. But wait, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, a tiny inkling. So the Maryland Department of Environment was charged with implementing the Clean Water Commerce Account for Environmental Outcomes uh, this year. And they had a deadline of September 9th, 2022. This program gave Department of Environment like 20 million or $25 million a year for the next 10 to 20 years or something to buy nitrogen. So they, they carved out $7 million per year to purchase nitrogen credits from agriculture for like I said, the next 10 to 20 years. I haven't heard the results of any of it yet. I don't know if Jeff has or not, because it, it just happened. So. What the producer had to do was, and oyster aquaculture was included in this, is they had to fill out this form and they had to say, I'm gonna remove this many credits and this is how much I wanna get paid for it over the next 10 to 20 years and send it in. And then the Department of Environment will was looking at everything and then they decide who to buy credits from. It's, to me, I had one grower say, it's almost like the price is right. You know, that guy's $10 cheaper, so they're gonna buy his credits, not gonna buy mine. So I don't know how this is really gonna end up working out, but there's our, our little light at the tunnel that there might be a little, a little bit, um, uh, some purchases coming up. So one of the big issues with these purchases is they're location-based. So, I live on the western side of Maryland, the western side of the bay. Jeff lives on the eastern side of the bay. So if Jeff creates a bunch of credits, I can't necessarily go buy them from my regulatory market because we're not in the same watershed. It doesn't work out. So that makes the market difficult. I also have heard that shortly before I started, all the wastewater treatment plants in Maryland were given money and helped upgrade their systems so they were more efficient which was one of the markets people were hoping to sell credits to back in 2009, 2010, when this, this started coming in. So it wiped out the market. So there's a lot of issues. So unless there's some sort of downward pressure or we sell a lot more of the Baltimore Convention Center, you know, it might take a while before this thing really takes off and, and gets going. And with that, like Jeff, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, there's contact information. If you think of something later on, I'd be glad to try to answer it then as well. Thank you, Matt. You got to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Who are the credit providers? Who are we providing these credits? The agriculture Did, industry or farmers? Or? In terms of who's getting paid? Yeah. The $4,000? Yeah. Matt, so who is the. Uh, the farm generates the credits and the farm gets paid. And there's two ways to do that. One, you can take a, or I guess there's three ways to do it. You can take the default value that just the three inch oysters and say, here's my paperwork. That's all I'm going to do. And you just verify your reports and you arrange a sale and it goes to the Department of Environment and then you get your money. The other one is like, hey, I sell oysters of lots of different sizes. So you go in and take really good records and you couple of times a year you go out and you verify that you are harvesting oysters of all these different sizes and then you do the same thing. The other option is you can get a broker and we have one broker in Maryland, Blue Oyster Environmental, and they will come in and do all the extra paperwork and everything for you. You just say I harvested this many oysters. They'll come out and do your counts. They'll come out and, and double check and they'll verify, but they do that for a fee or a cut of the sale depending on how you have things um, set up with them and mm -hmm. i don't know what the current rates might be but uh and it might vary between different growers and whatever they work out based on how big they are but those are the three ways but yeah the farm is generating the credits and therefore the farm ends up getting the payment if we ever have trades 
Cool. All right. Thank you guys very much, Matt and Jeff. We appreciate you joining us. Um, we're going to move on. Good meeting me, you guys. If you want to hear the next uh, next several talks. Yeah, sure. I actually asked us if we'd stick around. Perfect. So, yeah, you just, right, I can do it that way, too. Sure. Um, can, can you all see the slides, Matt and Jeff? I can promise it'll all be uh, great. <laughs> Well, while he's um, getting this organized, I just want to um, acknowledge uh, a colleague who's not here, um, uh, Matt DePaulis. Um, he was our Coastal Policy Fellow for the last year, and um, a lot of the background work on this um, was done by Matt. Um, he was working through a, a, an arrangement with the um, Port of Sea Grant Program and the Center for Coastal Solutions in the College of Engineering at the University of Florida, and um, working under my direction and Christine Angelini's direction, and we had groups of students that were looking at different um, restoration agriculture issues, such as um, in particular uh, oyster gardening. Uh, Matt took a job. We were very happy about you know, him using that as a, a ability to ca catapult himself into a job. And he took a job with the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, which, um, as you know, is ground zero for um, what, what's happened in Southwest Florida. Um, obviously couldn't be here today um, to participate and um, and assist with this uh, talk, uh, but uh, he, he had a big role to play in the underlying research in particular. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to try and set the, the stage, the framework uh, for um, this um, relatively new area of restoration aquaculture in terms of um, how it works within our um, unique legal setting. Um, so we're going to be way outside the watershed of the Chesapeake Bay and down back down here in Florida. Um, so I'll start with giving an overview of the, um, the jurisdiction, the agencies uh, that are involved, um, both from the standpoint of the ownership um, of the resource and um, in terms of the regulatory, um, uh, uh, their regulatory authority uh, over those resources. And um, I'll just note here that we have the experts in the room from each of the agencies that I'll be talking about. We'll have a panel tomorrow, um, and they can, A, correct the record. Um, they know their rules and their statutes um, better than anyone, um, and they know each other's better than anyone, I would say. So um, what I'll do is set the stage, and then we'll talk about it in a panel tomorrow that I'll be facilitating. I'll talk about some planning instruments and the role of planning in all of this, which I think is extremely significant. Um, this concept of ecosystem services and payments for ecosystem services, which is um, fascinating what Chesapeake Bay is doing. It's not just about credit trading. Um, so we'll have Blair Morrison um, following me talk about nutrient credit trading as one form of that, but there are other ways to um, pay for ecosystem services. And I will touch on those. And then I'll just leave you with some of the issues that um, we have thought about in terms of um, how this moves forward and what the challenges are. So from the proprietary standpoint, um, most folks in here know this, but all those submerged lands out there are typically owned by the state of Florida. Um, they are owned and held um, under a legal doctrine that um, goes way back to old England called, or even back to actually to Rome, um, called the public trust doctrine. Uh, it was constitutionalized in the state of Florida in our constitution. Um, it um, makes the state the trustee, the state agency, the state government, the trustee, um, for the people of the state of the submerged lands, and it is subject to um, use for fishing, swimming, and navigation. So every decision that's made has to be made through that lens. Um, interestingly, um, the earliest cases involving the public trust doctrine in the state of Florida were disputes over public access to oyster beds. It's a fascinating history if you like the cultural side of that. Um, these uh, submerged lands are subject to riparian rights of upland owners, um, they are administered by the governor and cabinet, which is known as a 
uh, but they're administered by the trustees of the Internal Improvement Trust Fund, which is the governor and cabinet. Um, that goes back way back into Florida's history as to um, how that uh, name came out, uh, came about. Um, and there's a statute, uh, the state land statute, Chapter 253, and the Aquatic Preserve Act, Chapter 258, um, that further articulates uh, the um, responsibilities of the state under uh, the submerged lands, for submerged lands. Um, that sets up a, what's called a public interest test where the decisions that are made by these agencies um, have to be um, in public interest or consistent with the public interest or not consistent with the public interest, three different legal standards. Um, and then you drill down one level further um, to the rules that uh, are uh, at play, um, the rules that implement the statute that implements the constitution that came from the common law. Um, and this is uh, chapter 1821. Of the, of the Florida Administrative Code, the Senate Plans Rule, and then um, Chapter 1822 for Aquatic Preserves. I want to note and make um, uh, and, uh, uh, and emphasize that there are non state owned submerged lands. Um, this is a product of our history um, here in Florida that um, some of these are owned by private parties because they were conveyed by the state either before uh, the interest in protecting them uh, existed the way it does now. Um, or they were conveyed to local governments for development purposes, St. Augustine Harbor, uh, parts of Tampa Bay, parts of Biscayne Bay near the city of Miami are all owned by those cities. So they are not state-owned sovereign submerged lands. You don't have to go get a lease from the state for those. Um, but this idea of the public trust doctrine may still apply, and there's a recent case on that, which is quite interesting. I just point out this presents special opportunities. Gary Hurd here, he's taken advantage of one of those, I believe, um, for aquaculture, including restoration aquaculture, because it's privately owned. Um, another good example is the St. Pete Bank, St. Petersburg Seagrass Mitigation Bank. Some of you are familiar with the issues around seagrass mitigation and banking that have been in our legislature the last couple of years. That wasn't an issue here because it's not state-owned sovereign submerged land. So um, the, the lease approval was not required for that. Hmm. In terms of where this all comes from, you heard a little bit about it. It all comes from the Clean Water Act in terms of what's driving this process that we're here, here today discussing, um, the impairment of uh, the waters uh, of the United States. Um, they, they are impaired for nutrients. They are impaired for coliform. They're impaired for a variety of different things. Um, this triggers uh, an obligation on the part of the state, which implements the Clean Water Act to set a total maximum daily load. Um, that load is a number. Um, and that requires um, the entity responsible for the administration to do a basin management action plan, or in the case of Tampa Bay here and some other um, earlier uh, efforts, uh, reasonable assurance plan, uh, which is sort of what they were talking about, I believe, in that Chesapeake Bay context, although it's different there because it's a unique statute, a federal statute there. Uh, but there's the what the basin action management plan does. It's a framework for restoration Water quality restoration, it contains local and state commitments to reduce pollutant loading through current and future project strategies. So what we're talking about here today can be one of those strategies, right? That's, uh, it, but it needs to be in that basin action management plan to do that. And another thing I'll note is that there are a number of estuarine systems, in fact, very many, particularly in the Southwest Florida region and tidal creeks that have not yet been designated as impaired and hence have no TMDL. So there's nothing driving the process there as of yet, but they're on list to be listed. We can't forget again about the federal government um, in a different context, which is uh, its authority to um, protect waters from uh, basically filling in this case and from obstructions to navigation. There's two statutes that um, provide that protection. One is Section 10 from the 1899 Rivers and Harbors Act. Um, and then the other is the newer 404, Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, which regulates filling in water of the United States. Um, activity that you're doing in terms of restoration and aquaculture both um, could um, involve putting things in the water that um, com uh, constitute fill from the standpoint of the definition of that. There are what are called programmatic permits. These are permits that are program wide, so you don't have to get an individual permit. Um, that may apply. Now, the state. Um, we have three agencies that have primacy um, in this area. Uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services, and the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. 
Um, DEP, Tim Rock is here representing DEP. They are charged with ministering all these submerged lands other than aquaculture. Um, and they issue what are called use authorizations. This is the right to use um, the submerged lands for some purpose that is A, consistent with the public interest and B, consistent with the, uh, not inconsistent with the public interest and consistent with the public trust doctrine. Um, DEP is also charged with protecting water quality. And they do that pursuant to this Clean Water Act delegation uh, through something called an environmental resource permit um, for the alteration of surface water. So that's a, a decision that's made based upon the nature of the activity. And again, there are programmatic and general permits that may apply that uh, preclude the need to go into uh, an individual permitting situation. And then um, the, the, the larger, uh, the agency with the larger responsibility, of course, are on aquaculture. And, and now um, restoration aquaculture is the Department of Agricultural and Community Service, um, Consumer Services. Is Charlie here? I, yeah, so we have Charlie Culpepper. Um, Charlie is uh, the representative from FDAX um, here, and he'll be on the panel tomorrow as well. And um, they have responsibility for aquaculture in the state under their statute, Chapter 597, which is one of the shorter statutes I've seen actually um, uh, uh, in, in re recently. Uh, but it defines aquaculture very broadly. So it's the cultivation of aquatic organisms. There's some language after that. Um, but that's a big that's a big term, right? That's plants, that's animals. And it's not limited to just consumption for food, for commerce. Um, and it's not limited necessarily to animals. So um, they are charged with administering just like the EP and under the same rule from the government cabinet, um, the use authorization when aquaculture is involved. Uh, and most recently, and Charlie will probably talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, um, they had amended their rule of 1821 to specifically authorize aquaculture restoration in limited circumstances. And one of the things we might want to talk about is, is that enough at this point? Um, and this, uh, this authorizes aquaculture restoration for primarily non-commercial purposes. Um, Sarasota Baywatch got the first project under this new rule with their uh, clam project. And it has our definition the controlled propagation and subsequent planting and husbandry of native aquatic plants and animals on sovereign submerged lands, not affixed to a public or private docker pier for wild population enhancement. Okay. I'm sorry. That, and that not affixed uh, language to a public docker pier is quite interesting. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. And last but certainly not least is the Florida uh, Conservation, Florida Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, they are a constitutional agency. Um, they don't uh, they don't uh, answer to the Florida legislature except for their budget, which means they sort of do answer to the Florida legislature. But um, at least in terms of their legal authority, they don't. And um, they have the responsibility to protect uh, wildlife in Florida and uh, ensure that its uh, its use is appropriate from a fisheries and uh, um, hunting and those sorts of things. And this includes the introduction and reintroduction of plants. Um, and animals, um, including for aquaculture. And so they have also have a broad definition for the marine organisms. They're defined as an organism, including plants that has a natural portion of its life cycle that is dependent upon the marine or estuarine waters. Lisa Gregg is here um, from, from that agency, and she has much of the responsibility here for reviewing uh, projects such as these. Um, they typically require what's called a special activity license to introduce or reintroduce um, plants and animals into the environment. And there's several kinds, two of which um, are specific to aquaculture and one is more specific to scientific research. Um, and I'll just note here that FWC is also charged in a, a different part of the agency with regulating boating and waterways. And this includes signage, which is an important aspect, um, particularly if you're trying to restrict, restrict boating around an area in order to protect it or to, um, manage it. And this is a, there's a whole other jurisdictional issue here that um, we should have a conversation about at some point um, regarding that authority. And that involves the area of seagrass. Um, so planning is, um, I think, um, sort of a significant piece of this whole project. It's, it's sort of a lot of people here are looking for ways to get funding, for ways to get these projects started. If it's not in the plan, it's much harder. And there's lots of plans out there. Um, over these waters and over these submerged lands. 
So this is the state of Florida aquaculture plan. It's um, it's driven, required by Florida statutes, required to be amended. It's reviewed by the Florida Aquaculture Review Council. Um, and these provisions, which I suspect are probably relatively new, are both directly um, related to and intended to encourage uh, restoration, at least the looking at of um, the, the um, study and uh, uh, growth of restoration aquaculture. Then we have regulatory, then we have managed areas as we call them around the state. There are state parks and aquatic preserves and then there's non-regulatory managed areas um, that um, federal government has the National Estuary Program, National Estuary Research Reserves. There are some federal, particularly in the Keys, uh, regulatory areas as well. Um, but um, I guess what's significant here is that uh, within aquatic reserves and much of the state of these emerged lands now are in aquatic reserves. Um, you can still do aquaculture, but it has to be compatible with the reserve. The reserve has a reserve man preserve, has a preserve management plan. If there's something that is affirmative in that preserve management plan that encourages the type of activities we're talking about, it's going to be much easier to argue about compatibility than if there's nothing there, it's silent. You'll have to make some, uh, some more sort of um, nuanced arguments. And DEP, which is the manager of these aquatic preserves, can argue that something is inconsistent with the preserve plan. And if that's the case, it can be elevated to the governor and cabinet. Um, and this is an example from the, uh, down below that, um, is an example from the Sarasota Bay National Estuary Plan, uh, which recently you know, benefited from this, uh, A, this, this new regulatory um, permit from, uh, from FDAX and also funding from uh, the state. Uh, and, Part of the reason I suspect is that they wanted to do it, right? To research, support research to understand the benefits of native dive valve stock enhancement for improvements to water quality, habitat, and native populations. So put it in the plan is the sort of the lesson there. And I don't want to forget about local governments because um, most people think local governments sort of jurisdiction often ends at the water's edge. Counties go out to the state line. Um, they have political authority and they have planning authority and they have some regulatory authority if, if it's not otherwise preempted by the federal state government. Um, and so it does behoove you to encourage your counties and your local governments. The city of St. Pete Beach goes out to the state line, a little pie shape, it looks like this. Uh, the town of Marineland on the East Coast goes out to the three mile line. Um, they have a uh, political jurisdiction there. They can do things, including planning. And we worked on a project, Savannah was involved in that um, in Hernando County, and that's benefited um, as well as Josh now has a project doing sponge aquaculture, which I would argue is at least partially um, uh, made easier, I suppose, by the fact that um, this was something that uh, the folks in Hernando County wanted to explore. Oh. oh, there we go. I don't remember doing this, but there it is. Um, <laughs> There you go. Um, so ecosystem services, you know, that's the, that's what we're talking about. What are the what is it that these uh, organisms do, and how do we uh, pay people for the services that they provide? One of them, Blair Morrison here, we'll talk about um, in considerable detail um, uh, is uh, nutrient credit trading. It's very um, I don't know what the right word is. If you're a law student, it's sexy because it involves all this. Um, uh, discussion about cap and trade and how you figure it out within a legal context and so forth. Um, Florida has a program already in place for nutrient, nutrient credit trading. It's a voluntary program. It is targeted toward point sources, not non-point sources, which is much of what um, concerns us. Um, but um, I would note that uh, municipal stormwater treatment systems are point sources, at least in terms of the permitting that's required. Um, so um, the cities like Tampa and so forth have these um, these permits for their municipal treatment systems. They may be able to work within this context um, as well. Uh, it's primarily being exercised right now in the St. John's River Basin. There are other forms of ecosystem service payment. Uh, it doesn't all have to be trading someone doing something upstream um, that's affecting the nutrient load downstream and compensating for that. You can just pay directly uh, to farmers and to um, those who uh, provide the payments um, through different sources. One is subsidies, um, those subsidies, and the other is taxes, um, and the other is fees. 
And the difference between tax and fee is um, something that lawyers argue about constantly, and we won't have that conversation here. But um, in terms of the subsidies, um, you heard a little bit about it just, just in the prior talk, um, the government programs, um, this farm subsidies, this program with the National Conservation Resource Conservation Service. We were gonna have somebody here, I guess the person couldn't make it. They have money available to provide um, to farmers, including aquaculture farmers, to support activities that support conservation and presumably nutrient removal and nutrient management. We have in Florida the Restore Act, which is a continuing source of funds to counties. Um, so those are one way you can pay for these credits without trading for something else happening upstream. There are taxes, nobody likes taxes, um, but there are also ways to redirect existing taxes, particularly from the local government standpoint, a concept called tax increment financing, um, which you typically see in community downtown redevelopment, but there's no reason why if there's jurisdiction over the water, it can't extend into the water and you cannot convince your local government to offer some, some money for that as well. Savannah's giving me the hook, but I'm retired, so what's the what? <laughs> What are you going to do, Sue? <laughs> um, I got one more slide. Um, so fees. So fees is another another one. And um, Kelly um, Kelly Hammer Weeby is here from uh, the Florida Stormwater Association, uh, and we have stormwater utilities, and you pay your stormwater utility fee. Um, stormwater is a major source of nutrients and nitrogen that goes into the waters of this these highly urbanized area. Would it be possible to extract or take some of that funding that's going from that stormwater utility um, to uh, pay farmers to clean up the, the mess at the downstream level? That's the thought. So I'll leave you with these some of the issues that we're um, going to be grappling with, I suppose. And you've already heard some of this. What is the state of the science? If we're going to move this stuff into policy, we need to know. The guys that were working on the numbers, it took them six years, it sounds like, to even get to the point of a couple trades. Um, matching the geographies, particularly if we're going to do trading. You know, and, and uh, these geographies are rather uh, difficult in the context of estuaries. You know, what watershed are you actually in? What are you, uh, watershed are you actually cleaning up? Um, the, the idea of concentrating single species uh, in a in an area. Are you displacing other species? Are you excluding it? Are you changing habitats? Um, the risks. The risks are a big one. We just saw the, the classic example down in, in Southwest Florida. One is underperformance, right? Particularly if you're doing trading. The other is failure, particularly if you're doing trading. And then this concept of force majeure, which is um, you'll find in contracts, um, which is the otherwise called an act of God, and it often excuses uh, someone from performance. So if a big developer of a mitigation bank um, is blown out by a, uh, a storm, if there's a clause that says they are excused, then you're going to still have the development and you're not going to have the mitigation. Um, then there's this governance question, which is why we're here today. Um, the jurisdiction of the three agencies and how they mesh together, and is that the right policy framework? Can we work within it? Do we need to um, improve it? And then finally, this question of scale. I mean, how much is this going to take to make a difference? Is it worth all the effort that we're putting into it? Um, and do we have to put all the weight of the world on it, or is it just a piece of the puzzle? Or stated differently, is a billion plans enough? Thank you. Oh, here's my final picture. <laughs> Sorry for the memory. I probably exhausted my question, right? For that, for that's the, uh... <laughs> Wisely done. <laughs> um, oh, it looks like we might have lost Jeff. And... Oh, no, just still there. Hey Jeff, if you can hear me, sorry about that. We're gonna we'll get the uh, slide moving issue fixed. That's all right. It's a I enjoy the talk. It's it's uh, partially uh, uh, preaching to the converted though. <laughs> <laughs> I like what was being said. All right, I'm gonna I'll actually check with you on this one to make sure I'm sharing the screen correctly. Our next speaker is Blair Morrison. Um, she was a National Academies fellow with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Mm -hmm. What is going on? Sorry, Blair. <laughs> You're fine. All right, let's share a screen. Just building the anticipation. Just share the overall screen. This? this? Yeah. Okay. 
and then we'll start a slideshow. Beautiful. Okay, does that look okay, Jeff? Is that advancing for you? Okay. Cool. Thank you, Liv. Yeah. All right. Am I good to go ahead and start? Go for it. Cool. All right. Hey, y'all. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, thank you, Josh, for that introduction. My name is Blair. I uh, am still a science policy fellow with the National Academy of Sciences Gulf Research Program and the Division of Aquaculture at FDAX. And this is a, a project I've been working on for a little bit over a year as a part of my fellowship. So I'm excited to dive into uh, a brief foray into some of the potential options that could exist for nutrient credit trading in Florida with aquaculture as the basis. So to start off, um, just kind of setting the groundwork, what is nutrient credit trading? Um, broadly, it's a program where industries and enterprises that generate excessive compounds of environmental concern can offset their environmental impacts by purchasing credits from an industry, farmer, or conservation group is reduce their environmental impacts beyond what's stipulated by law or regulation. So that's a really long way to say there's a lot of flexibility in what we're using as the basis for a nutrient credit trading program. What we're most common, like, you know, when we're talking about nutrient credit trading, a lot of the times um, the basis for credits that we're talking about are nitrogen species like nitrate and nitrite and also phosphate, because those are nutrients that are important for plant growth. They're often found in agricultural runoff and they can cause algal blooms and a lot of issues in coastal systems. But this isn't the only thing that uh, is used as the basis for a credit in a trading program. There are also um, mitigations of heavy metals like mercury and lead. Um, also carbon dioxide and carbon trading is another popular method that's um, being discussed in lots of places around the world. And then one that people don't think about a lot is sediment um, that's caused from ground disruptions, usually due to development and increased turbidity is a problem in, in coastal areas. So all of these can be potential for the basis of this nutrient credit trading program. So in Florida specifically, how could we generate credits? Generally, we're talking about the cultivation of aquacultured commodities that extract and or store nutrients from the external environment. So no, no uh, fin fish aquaculture yet, <laughs> no feeding of these things um, of external sources. So some examples of this are salt marsh restoration, shellfish aquaculture like oysters and clams, sponge aquaculture, and then seaweed. Seaweed's not currently um, like permitted, but soon hopefully um and also for sponges there's not any formal leasing process but it's in the works and so it's important to note that as we're moving from left to right these are higher uh low salinities to higher salinity environments and we're moving from you know near shore to offshore in terms of these commodities so to give you all a very general conceptual diagram of how something like this could work in florida um, this is, you know, just clip art Picasso here. So potentially you have industry that is uh, inputting phosphates and nitrate into a body of water. You have a municipal area that has a lot of stormwater pollution. So we're getting a lot of nutrient loading into a particular system. So when that happens, we have particular and dissolved nutrients that are moving downstream. And those can lead to deleterious effects. Um, you know, harmful algal blooms, loss of benthic habitats. There's a lot of different things that those, uh, those excessive nutrients can cause. But if we add some aquaculture along this water body, uh, we have, you know, wetland restoration, some oysters, some clams, and potentially some sponges. And these are just a couple of the options that we could explore. We have commercial um, farms for shellfish, restoration leases, um, wetland restoration out planters and then sponge farms. Um, in this example, we have a lot of different kind of business models incorporated in this nutrient credit trading program. And what we see from these aquaculture um, ventures in this watershed is that the inputs of these nutrients are actually taken up by these different aquaculture commodities and it reduces the overall load as you move downstream which reduces the amount of nutrients that you 
ultimately have going into estuaries and you know your you know Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. So overall, why do we need nutrient remediation? Well, if you see this map here, this is a map of all of the 29 watersheds in Florida. All 29 of these watersheds have water bodies that are considered imperiled by uh, DEP's watershed assessment group. So everywhere on that map has imperiled bodies of water. And in 86% of those watersheds, the coastal and estuarine waters are imperiled due to nutrient related factors. So this is nitrate, phosphate, chlorophyll A, um, and algal mats. So any combination of those factors. And like I was saying, excess nutrients can lead to harmful algal blooms, which I'm sure a lot of us are very familiar with in terms of red tides, fish kills, loss of benthic habitats like seagrass um, and coral, and also low oxygen, which is a persistent issue in lots of areas throughout the state. So what systems already exist in Florida? Tom mentioned this. Um, but there is legislation that already exists to govern the provisional trading of nutrient credits through an office within FDEP. And this only allows for trading between point sources. So those can include uh, wastewater treatment plants, municipalities, and industries, anywhere that is a direct pollution source into a watershed. And a pilot program utilizing this framework for point source trading only was implemented in the Lower St. Johns River, which we see circled in this map. And they were able to achieve 90% of their reductions in uh, phosphorus and 84% of their projected reductions in nitrogen. So this is a really important proof of concept that this model can work. But on the flip side of things, after this pilot program ended, there was really limited engagement in the market following that pilot period. Um, so this is kind of one of the challenges. How do you keep the momentum going with, with these programs? And incorporating aquaculture into the system that already exists requires an expansion or an amendment to the existing rule. So we're not creating the wheel again. We just have to add some extra spokes to it, essentially. And um, as uh, Tom mentioned and several of our other speakers mentioned, markets in Florida would likely need to be administered on a watershed level basis just because we're not the Chesapeake. We don't have any semi-enclosed basins, really. Um, and so our watersheds are very different from the Panhandle to South Florida. So there are lots of, you know, variations we need to, to consider. So who would be involved with a potential uh, nutrient credit trading program? This requires collaboration between state agencies, research partners, farmers, industry leaders, NGOs, and stakeholders in each watershed. And the logos that you see on the side, those are just a smattering of people. This is not an exhaustive list of people that would need to be involved. Um, but the program could be divided into three main components. So the administration, management, and upkeep, and brokering. Um, so there's a really interesting kind of diagram that I've created in an executive summary of this program um, that has a lot of moving pieces and a lot of people that would be involved um, from FDACs administering the aquaculture side of things to DEP. Uh, we have federal oversight from the EPA. Um, you'd have to have certification of credits through the Department of Financial Services, understanding geology, and then the watershed management districts throughout the state. So also, this has been touched on before by our earlier speakers. Where has this been done before? In the Chesapeake. Uh, the Chesapeake is like the poster child excellent case study for this program. Um, the Chesapeake was given a federal mandate. It was a really unique um, kind of mandate that was sent down from EPA to reduce the nutrient load to the bay. And that was the onus for each state around the Chesapeake creating their own guidelines for administering a nutrient credit trading program. And so each state has their own rules, um, but they all are working towards this federal mandated reduction um, to nutrients. And certain states have public and private partnerships for brokering credits. They were talking about um, brokering and like clearing houses for credits, but then there are also some states that have that all administered under a public kind of state umbrella. So what do we need to get this off the ground? First thing, lots of information. Um, there are a lot of data gaps 
that we need to address to really get a program like this um, to a point where credits can be certifiable and quantifiable. So for some of our data gaps that we need to address, first, we need baseline water quality data in a lot of areas around Florida. It's really unfortunate that there are so many places we just don't know what the long-term trends in nutrients look like. And um, for us to have kind of a solid baseline of knowing how the aquaculture is impacting certain areas, we need to know what the nutrient kind of levels were like to begin with. So that's demonstrated by these kind of water quality songs that you see that just popped up. Um, it would be helpful for us to have at least temperature, salinity, turbidity, chlorophyll A, and nutrient records for areas where we're wanting to implement a nutrient credit trading program. Also, we need to understand the interactions between underlying geology and hydrology of watersheds. So throughout the state of Florida, we're on a really interesting carbonate platform and the Florida aquifer has complicated interactions with you know, discharging groundwater to coastal systems that affects nutrient flows, that affects the way that those ecosystems function. So not only do we need to know what's going on in the water column, we need to know what's going on underground too. And of course that looks different for every watershed. Also, we need better in-situ data for filtering rates and clearance efficiencies of shellfish and sponges, anything that's filtering. Um, it's easy to take some data that we have you know, from the Chesapeake or from other parts of the Gulf and be like, oh, well, we could expect to see that here in Tampa Bay or in Biscayne Bay. But unfortunately, a lot of times that's comparing apples to oranges and environmental conditions can really affect the way that these animals are, are functioning in their environment. So we do need to have better data to support just kind of a, an underlying rate of filtration for these animals. And last but not least, we need to have better understanding of nutrient storage capacity uh, of these different commodities in tissues and or in the surrounding sediments. So with shellfish in particular, there's assimilation of nutrients into tissues and shells but there's also sequestration of nutrients in the sediments around them. So there are lots of pieces to, to this very interesting puzzle that we need to have better data on so we can get this program implemented. And in terms of policy, there are a lot of interesting ongoing questions, which Tom touched on as well, um, but these are just a couple of kind of broad scale, broad brushstroke questions that we, we need to consider. So first of all, what compounds do we want to be the focus of our credit trading program? So they could be the traditional nitrogen and phosphorus, but some places may need more of a reduction in sediment. Um, some places may be imperiled more by heavy metals. So we need to understand you know, what the needs are of our different watersheds. Also, should we focus only on point source trading like we have now, or do we want to go forward and incorporate aquaculture and non-point source offsets into the credit trading program. We also need to talk about what activities are going to be eligible for generating credits. So I focused on the aquaculture activities that could be kind of input as ways to generate credits in the system. There are also terrestrial activities that can be used to mitigate nutrients like cover crops and agricultural best management practices and riparian zone restoration. So we have to figure out what we want the scale of this uh, market to be. Also, what processes do we want to use to certify credits generated? Um, I know some of our other speakers have talked about clearing houses, kind of taking care of the paperwork and the, um, the certification of credits. So we need to have discussions about what that process would look like for the state of Florida. Um, how do credit trading values, um, how do we figure out what they're going to be valued as? Uh, depending on the watershed and the demand for credits in different areas, that's going to have a lot to do with what we end up paying people uh, for the ecosystem services their commodities are creating. Then which agencies and groups need to be at the table um, for the administration, management, and brokering aspects of the program. And then ultimately, how should the trading process be recorded and overseen? 
Um, what kind of public record do we want all of these brokerings to have? And what does that interface look like for our stakeholders and for the public? So that was a lot of questions. I'm sure we will have lots of time to discuss them. Um, I'm happy to take any of your questions now. And like I said, for more information, you can check out the full nutrient credit white paper on the FDAX Division of Aquaculture website. And I actually have a handy QR code for y'all. Um, this just went live on our website this week. So it is hot off the presses. And also I have some um, one pagers on nutrient credit trading as well um, that I have printed with me. So if you'd like one of those, just find me. I'm happy to give one. Mm -hmm. We'll find Blair later for questions. Yeah, yeah Tom went over. <laughs> Our next speaker is Ashley Smith. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thirteen minutes. Tom, Tom, Tom. I'll talk really, really fast. No, <laughs> no one wants that. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida at our Tropical Research and Education Center, based in our Soil, Water, and Ecosystem Science Department. When I first moved to Florida in 2017, I thought I was done talking about shellfish and the nitrogen cycle. I had moved here from Kansas after working in North Carolina and Virginia, where all I did was talk about shellfish and nitrogen. Fast forward a couple years, everybody down in Florida wants to know about shellfish and nitrogen cycling. So I'm happy to say that I am not yet done talking about it. I'm going to share with you some work today that we're doing in my lab that's focused on aqu shellfish aquaculture and water quality restoration in Florida. This work that I'm going to share is just a snapshot of what we've been doing, but it's really part of a large group effort and a project that's funded by the Nature, Con Nature Conservancy's uh, SOAR program that includes many people who are in this room right now. But when I've been and Florida and around, we keep hearing this promise of shellfish, all these great things that shellfish can do. First, we start to hear about, oh, there's all these coastal water quality declines, this, uh, these harmful algal blooms, these low oxygen events. But then shellfish provide all these ecosystem services. They filter water, they can reduce turbidity, they can help transfer nutrients, they remove nitrogen, uh, store carbon, store phosphorus. And that there's a lot of benefit to using multiple species in restoration, shellfish and seagrass, to really help increase success of these larger restoration projects. And I also keep hearing a lot about this interest in nutrient trading credit, credits, especially as a new way or new revenue stream for a lot of our shellfish farmers. And the other thing is that there are a lot of ongoing efforts currently in Florida around shellfish restoration. We have clam restoration in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, we have the Sanibel Captiva Foundation use, doing some clam restoration. Then Sarasota Baywatch, who will hopefully hear, who are here today, are also doing some clam restoration activities. More efforts to really, really think about putting our clams back into the environment. We have the Gulf Shellfish Institute and some of their restoration objectives, trying to restore clams and oysters. And then more recently, we've had some funding from the state to really invest in restoring seagrasses and clams in our three uh, national estuaries on the Gulf Coast. So there is a lot of conversation all around the state and in many different water bodies around the benefits that shellfish provide for water quality and for other habitats. But what do we really know? when we think about shellfish and water quality? Well, we know that land-based sources of reduction of nutrients are not enough. We still have nitrogen problems in many of our waterways. We also know that there is diminishing economic benefits for further improvements in wastewater treatment plants to uh, eliminate nitrogen or nutrient loading. So we're kind of hitting a limit on that front. And we also know that reducing non-point source pollution is next to impossible. It's easy to pinpoint something when you have a point source and say right there, that's where that nitrogen is coming from. But 
on a watershed scale, well, we don't really know where all this nitrogen is coming from, it makes it really difficult to control. And we know, as Jeff talked about, Matt talked about, shellfish filter water, they remove nitrogen. Pulling all this together, I feel like there's a lot of things that we still don't know. And these are sort of the questions that are guiding some of the work that my, uh, my research group is doing and some of the work uh, around the state. We don't really know how variability in the form of aquaculture on bottom, off bottom, how people are, the husbandry of growing clams and oysters, and then different locations or environmental conditions are affecting uh, these the water quality benefits from shellfish. We don't really know if clams, oysters, and mussels all provide the same benefits. A lot of what we just heard about from Chesapeake Bay was really oyster focused. I don't think they mentioned clams once. And down here, that's all we hear about. All we have, you know, that's what we are focused on. We don't really know what the effects of shellfish restoration are or shellfish are with seagrass. Some of the results from the literature are pretty mixed on if it's a benefit or a negative. And then what we really need are some of these species and locally specific data from Florida are still lacking. During COVID, we did a review on how we measure denitrification in oyster systems, and there was not a single data point for Florida. This also means that there is a lot of potential in shellfish restoration, uh, both in terms of growing industries and also in research support. So our work is funded that we're working on right now uh, after many attempts to get some of this funded because there was such a demand for this information uh, by the Nature Conservancy. And we're really focused on two sort two main goals, uh, figuring out what, how bivalve culture could be used for meeting water quality goals. The first is we are hoping to not hoping to, we are going to, because we've already made some progress on this, mm -hmm. quantifying the nitrogen removal benefits from shellfish aquaculture in Florida. These will be the first measured rates of denitrification from Florida shellfish that meet the standards that Jeff was talking about earlier. Uh, and then we can use this information to really figure out what the potential is for nitrogen removal from shellfish uh, in Florida waterways. Additionally, uh, we're working on figuring out this payment for ecosystem services. How much would municipalities, developers, or other buyers be willing to pay for credits? And then how much would a grower have to be paid to do something different on their farm if they could also get credits for these services? So now we'll finally know how much nitrogen is removed and how much that nitrogen is worth. So this summer, we've really taken our first uh, gone around and taken our first samples. And what we did when we tried to look for sites was pair sites where we knew there were active shellfish leases and there were nutrient issues. So our first map here shows all a bunch of the aquaculture use zones around the state. And the second map is just overlaying waterways, water bodies that are impaired for total nitrogen or chlorophyll or have a TMDL uh, already in place. We also wanted to make sure that the sites were actually located close to where my research lab is, which unfortunately is all the way down in Homestead. So uh, we don't really have oysters down there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Deantrification is a really complicated and challenging process to measure. It requires a lot of specialized equipment. And just the time that it takes from collecting that sample to starting to process it can uh, is it, short, and we need to we need to begin these experiments soon after we collect samples in order to not compromise the quality of our results. So we limited our locations to within six hours of my research lab. Uh, we ended up settling on Cedar Key and Tampa Bay as our focal areas. I'm going to show you some of our preliminary results today from our uh, summer sampling here in Tampa Bay. Oops, wrong button. Sorry, guys. Tampa Bay was a great case study because there is already this nitrogen management consortium. So they're already really care about nitrogen and are trying to figure out ways to manage nitrogen. In fact, this control of nitrogen is part of their paradigm for restoration in the area where they wanna reduce nitrogen loads to reduce algal growth, to increase water clarity, to then help support seagrass growth. So it seems like having a better sense of how nitrogen is cycling in the presence of shellfish here would be really valuable into the context uh, 
of the Nutrient Management Consortium, and then we could have potential buyers in this watershed for these credits. So we went out and measured our denitrification rates uh, from clam aquaculture farms and oyster aquaculture farms, all located in the Tampa Bay region. In addition to on-farm or, or sites that were affected by the shellfish, we have these control sites which are areas that are right there nearby, don't have any sediment, don't have any shellfish on them, and they're considered our background. Because denitrification happens anyway, it's nature's way to remove nitrogen. So if we wanna figure out what the shellfish are doing, we have to see how much is enhanced or augmented with their presence. And then this is very preliminary data, so it is subject to change, but I wanted to show you all what we've been doing today. And then sort of walk you through what we can do when we have a data of this type. So what we found was that denitrification was in fact increased in the presence of shellfish in our different locations or in our with our both of our shellfish species. Uh, our oyster aquaculture removes about 0.5 grams per meter squared per day of nitrogen, while clam aquaculture removes 0.1 grams per meter squared per day. This is just from that enhanced denitrification. So that increase in denitrification with the presence of the shellfish above what's their background. We can then sort of upscale this number to figure out what's happening uh, at a more regional scale. And what I used was the area of current leases occupied in Tampa, the P Tampa Bay region. And DJ, I could be wrong with this, so correct me if I'm way off base, but I think it's about 32 football fields worth of current uh, occupation of shellfish lease area. Using that number, I can then figure out how much nitrogen is being removed through denitrification of these two different with these two different bivalves present. And what I find is that 0.3 milliton, uh, metric tons per year of nitrogen are being removed with oysters, and 4.25 metric tons of nitrogen are being removed with denitrification with the clams. This is just in our Tampa Bay region. But denitrification is not the only way that they clams, oysters remove nitrogen. It's also through this uh, extractive component. So when that shellfish is harvested and sold, that nitrogen that's in the shell and tissue is also removed. This is what they're trading in Maryland. So I use data from Maryland to show what they've come up with for the amount of nitrogen in oysters, and then data from one of Shirley's papers to about the nitrogen content in the clams. Uh, and for these calculations, I used the maximum number. So keep that in mind as I walk you through some of the next pieces of what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but to sort of say like, what is the real impact we, we could have? And I assumed that 10% of the activity of all clams and oysters sold in Florida was from the Tampa Bay region, which is probably an overestimate, yes. <laughs> uh, so again, very back of the envelope calculations, but kind of how we could move forward to really figure out the importance of shellfish for water quality. So we have our denitrification, and then we have our extraction services from our two shellfish. And overall, our oysters remove 0.42 metric tons of nitrogen per year, and our clams remove 4.28 metric tons of nitrogen per year. In the context of meeting water quality goals for the lower region of Tampa Bay, there is a nitrogen target of 570 metric tons of nitrogen per year. So at current scale, we are, shellfish are currently helping to remove about 1% of the nitrogen load. But this is only with current operations. So there is this potential to scale that up if aquaculture grows or if some of these aquaculture leases uh, restoration leases come into play as areas where you could culture uh, these organisms just for water quality benefits. The next phase of this work is to determine the value of that nitrogen removal service. Uh, this includes conducting surveys both on the supply side, so who, how much uh, the supplier would be willing, so the grower would be willing to needs to enter into a market, and then on the demand side, how much would people be willing to pay for these credits? Then we're going to do some growers choice experiments too. Uh, this is being led by Kelly Grogan in UF, uh, just to sort of figure out how on, on farm decisions might affect, might change with the potential for nutrient credits. So stay tuned for that. Overall, and I think everybody today has kind of ended with the same 
idea that there's still a lot to know and still a lot to consider when we think about shellfish, water quality, water quality restoration, all that fun stuff. Well, first we have our denitrification enhancement and we have our extractive services. So that nitrogen removal through assimilation. And those are pretty, pretty good ways to remove nitrogen. What I thought was interesting from what I just showed you all is that the denitrification is higher than the extractive services, which is really great from a restoration perspective, because that's what you're going to get when you just have clams out there that are out there filtering water quality or filtering water uh, annually. But there are many considerations that we have to account for when we're really thinking about where we're at in terms of using shell shellfish uh, for water quality goals. Figuring out the nitrogen source that we're going to meet. Blair talked a lot about how we have to have this as very uh, watershed specific. So there needs to be sort of a watershed nitrogen problem and probably a buyer in that watershed. We also have to have a better way to do our measurements and verification. Denitrification is hard. It's really difficult to measure. I can't go everywhere. I really wish I could. Uh, but sort of that that's a challenge. And then also just verifying how much is sold or removed from these extractive services as a farmer. We also have to consider siting cons what, where these are where these are going to be located. Jeff said that the sediment quality matters, and that's true. So if we just put a bunch of oysters in an area where the sediment is already really like mucky and has a high denitrification rate, then we might not see this enhancement. And there's also a ton of sources of variability that we're still up against before we can really say how much nitrogen is being removed through uh, through shellfish. But ultimately, I just talked a lot about shellfish and nitrogen removal, but just having our shellfish and doing restoration uh, does a lot more than just remove nitrogen. There's increased water clarity, there's habitat creation, we have shoreline protection uh, in some instances, there's stock enhancement, and then there's even potential for buffering against local acidification. So while I talk a lot about nitrogen, I think a lot about water quality, there's a lot more out there that we can that our shellfish provide for us and they are a tool in our overall toolbox for managing nitrogen and also for restoring our coastal waterways. Uh, thank you for all your time and i'll be happy to take any questions over beers because I was told to stop. This is still on. I guess this is still on. That's okay. All right, I'll just yell. So we're going to move into a break now. Um, but before we do that, I just want to give you an idea of what we're going to do next, just so um, it'll go smoother as we transition back. So next is the breakout groups. There are seven groups based on what you answered when you registered in terms of which of the three science policy or practice you identify with uh, most closely. And so there's your dot on your name tag matches the color of a dot on a flip chart. And we're going to need you to take a chair from the current location to your tables. Um, so when we move back into the breakouts, I'll give some more specific instructions, but just so you know, you might want to try to find where you're going and remember that you need to bring a chair with you. Um, yeah, so there's a series of prompts that we want everyone to work through and take some notes on the flip chart. So you'll have to designate a scribe and a note taker. Um, so, but anyway, we're going to give you a break now until 15 after. So get some coffee, restroom break, water. We'll call you back soon. Does it keep, does it turn itself on? Yeah. Oh, it does have a Okay. Oh, you know what I'm It has to be there. I'll leave it off right now. What you gonna do, Savannah? Jeff. Hey, <laughs> hey Jeff. Thanks so much. Sorry, we were, we were trying to have additional questions at the end, but we just ran out of time. That's so. all right. I, I basically sent a little note, basically reinforcing uh, what Ashley said. Our perspective here in the Chesapeake is remove nitrogen and phosphorus everywhere yeah. you can, credit it. It doesn't have to, you can't save the bay with just oysters. I'm having trouble hearing you, but. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I'll send a note along. 
Okay. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care.